we go. There we go. We're in business. Yep. Man, back up here. Okay, very good. And yeah. right on time to boot. Right. Um, <laughs> that's right. Well, good morning, everybody. Well, let's give it um, just a couple more minutes. We've got a good uh, number of folks on. I know uh, how it goes. We'll get a few more in the next couple minutes. Um, so we'll just give it a give it a second. Like uh, we've got a good mix of folks dialing in right now. We've got folks from our Cameron, uh, 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 enterprise architect from pre-sales, and it looks like we also have folks coming in from the the, the services side, the folks that actually get on the ground and, and work with our customers in a billable capacity. So, good mix of folks. Okay, great. And uh, I'll say good morning, Amy. Are, are you out there, Ms. Amy Stever? Maybe not. Maybe not. She's on the WebEx. Um, I'm just, uh, oh, there you go. I'm having trouble accessing the audio. I will send her. Hey, Jeremy, the conference number that shows up on the WebEx is not the number you sent out in the email. That's oh, yeah, the yeah. That's uh, a setting that I have to change in my WebEx settings. I apologize for that. They might want to put that up on the online, the real number. We have a, a, a bunch of folks. Oh, good morning, Ben. Thanks for joining. Um, yeah, I'll just post that to everybody and then we can So good morning, everybody. Welcome. Um, I'm very excited uh, for our session this morning, uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining. We've got, um, the, uh, I think, our largest turnout yet, which is fantastic. Um, so I'm excited to, to introduce Dr. Brian Cameron from the Center of Enterprise Architecture from Penn State, and also the, the person, the professor running the program that a number of, of folks are currently enrolled in. And folks are going to be enrolled in following up in the, in the January cohort. Um, so just a couple of things I'll, I'll say about Dr. Cameron is, and why I'm excited that he's here is both from the, the program perspective, I, you know, Penn State's got a very strong program, but also the work he's doing for the enterprise architecture career, uh, the growth of that, the demand in the industry for enterprise architecture, uh, the creating a discipline. Uh, career path for EAs and creating what he's going to talk about as a, as a, as a body to help um, mature the EA profession, which is, you know, one of the things, of course, everybody on this call is, is very interested in. Um, uh, Dr. Cameron is, you know, gets asked to speak all, the, all over the world uh, on this topic. Um, and uh, you know, for those of you who work with state and local governments, uh, even the federal government, but I know specifically with NASIO, He's very, very involved. I've, I've been on a couple of calls with the NASIO EA and Governance Committee where uh, Dr. Cameron has presented. So, uh, you know, he, he's very much a thought leader in this space right now. So I, I'm very, I think we're fortunate to have him this morning to, to address us and tell us from his perspective what's happening in the industry, what Penn State is doing. Um, and hopefully we can come, up, come out of this with some good understanding of, of where the career of EA is going. 
Um, and then at the end, if you want to, uh, I'll monitor the chat if people have questions. Um, uh, but I think because the number of folks on the call will hold questions till the end, uh, it hopefully have about 15 or so minutes to the end if we want to have a discussion with Dr. Cameron, if anyone has any questions. So without further ado, Dr. Cameron, I will hand it over to you. And again, thank you for joining us this morning. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Thanks for the invitation. Happy to be here today. Um, what I hope to do, folks, uh, I've got about a half an hour, 40-minute uh, presentation. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about the College of Information Sciences and Technology, our unique value proposition in the marketplace, and then talk a bit about why enterprise architecture? Why are we getting so much interest in our center, our research programs, our educational programs, et cetera, from all over the globe? And then drill down a bit on uh, our center, some of our activities, and then talk about some of our educational programs. And then wrap up with a discussion of uh, a new organization, relatively new organization, that I helped to found called uh, the Federation of Enterprise Architecture Professional Organizations. And this is uh, the organization that Jeremy was referring to that helping to set um, more of one face for this profession, helping to evolve this profession in a variety of areas that, that I'll talk about. And then I want to allow enough time for, for your questions and some discussion at the end. So let's get going. Uh, College of Information Sciences and Technology, just real briefly. Relatively new entity at Penn State, started in 1999 by the state of Pennsylvania in conjunction with a corporate advisory group to produce what we feel is the modern IT professional, somebody with a good foundation in a variety of areas of enterprise technology, but also a good foundation in business. We have a, a, a lot of real-world corporate experiences ingrained in our curriculum. Our students do mandatory internships. We boast uh, one of the highest uh, placement and salary rates on campus. And one of our traditional sweet spots in the marketplace uh, has been in enterprise integration and uh, enterprise systems integration. We have the only undergraduate enterprise integration curriculum that I know of in the United States. And as a result, our students are highly sought after by industry and government. Um, as I said, our students have one of the highest placement rates, highest starting salaries on campus, and many of our faculty have prior industry experience in their uh, respective areas and continue to do consulting and are very in engaged with, with industry. And, you know, and I, uh, I, my background is in enterprise systems. Uh, I've implemented uh, many ERP systems and, and other enterprise systems in prior lives and, and functioned as a CIO, and I've done a lot of enterprise architecture work and through the consulting and, and work that I continue to do, um, I've connected a lot of dots in the marketplace, which I'll talk about in a few moments, that uh, kind of evolved our, our, our thinking in this area. So in many ways, we have um, structurally as a college many of the foundational pieces needed to do something like enterprise architecture. I should also mention that, uh, that uh, our college um, as a unit is, is unique nationally in that we're not part of a traditional academic silo. We're not part of the College of Business. We're not part of computer science. We're not part of engineering. We're our own standalone college. And underneath our, the umbrella of our college, we have a very eclectic mix of faculty. We have folks from business schools. We have computer scientists. We have sociologists. We have psychologists. We have attorneys in our faculty. Uh, so this interdisciplinary mix of people under one roof allows us to think about programs like enterprise architecture in ways that, quite frankly, other uh, institutions uh, wouldn't be able to pull off. Most of the silos in academia traditionally don't work and play well with one another. So, so we're fortunate to have the structure that we have. So um, wh why enterprise architecture? Why are we getting so much interest in, in the things that we're doing here at Penn State? Um, we started the Enterprise Architecture Initiative in the middle of, well, actually the early parts of the global financial crisis, when many people told us we were nuts for trying to start new programs, et cetera, in the midst of all the budget cuts and everything that was, that, that was happening and continues to happen to this day. But what we were hearing, what I was hearing from many organizations is that during this time, um, they were giving new emphasis to enterprise architecture to help uh, generate more efficiencies, more make more effectiveness, making sure they were doing the right things and more agility. And we can we continue to see this with ripple effects in uh, all levels of government. Jeremy mentioned NASIO. I've done a number of webinars for the NASIO folks, and there's a new interest in enterprise architecture and establishing practices, centers of excellence, et cetera, at all levels of government today, and not just within the United States. I'm getting interest from literally all over the globe, corners of the globe that, that you'd never uh, think were looking at enterprise architecture are today. So related to that is also the hyper-global competition that, that we all face today, competition coming from all parts of the organization, so the, the needs to be 
the need to be uh, efficient, effective, and agile is, you know, uh, only increases uh, in organizations. Um, also, the shift that we see in many organizations from IT being viewed as a cost to be managed to that uh, as uh, of an enabler of business or or, or a, a strategic resource, if you will. Uh, the old mindset is that the IT is out here, the rest of the business is over here, and we've got to manage these costs. And not that that mindset still doesn't exist, but we're seeing more and more organizations see IT as a, just another part of the business, uh, as it should be. It's another part of the business, and we should manage it and think about it uh, as from an investment standpoint like we would um, any other part of the business. And related to that's the evolving role of the CIO. There's many, many uh, articles and perspectives on what the, the role of the CIO is going to look like in the future. And I think many of them uh, agree that as we outsource more, put more into the cloud, et cetera, that the role of the CIO becomes more about setting strategy, about architecting, and I think we're starting to see more of a convergence between the role of the chief architect and the CIO in many organizations. So we'll, we'll see how that continues into the future. Michael Porter, which many of you may be familiar with Michael Porter, a very famous uh, management consultant and faculty member. Um, Michael estimates uh, that in more of 80% of organizations, public and private, um, fail to execute their business strategies. And he goes on to say that you know the reason for this failure uh, to execute business strategy isn't necessarily with the strategy itself. It's not that the strategy is necessarily are fl flawed or bad, but in poor execution, poor tactical execution. And this failure to execute, to tactically implement your strategy, is one of the most significant challenges that organizations of all type uh, face in the 21st century, according to, to Gartner and many others. So enterprise architecture, uh, if it's structured correctly, staffed correctly, et cetera, can be and should be that bridge or that linchpin between strategy and technical execution and that bridge that's missing in many organizations today. And we'll just move on here. So the analogy, um, to just to build upon that idea, um, the analogy that you typically see with enterprise architecture that usually resonates with most people is the difference between a building architect and a city planner. So if we think of the building architect, the person that's primarily concerned with the construction of a single building, uh, as being um, analogous to that of a, a systems developer, systems architect, you know, the person that's concerned primarily just with the development of a single system versus the city planner. The city planner needs to understand what the building architect does, but also needs to understand a whole host of other things that the building architect typically doesn't concern him or herself with, such as zoning, sewage, traffic flows, you know, uh, electric, uh, electricity grid, and a number of other things. So in many ways, that's, that's analogous to the, the enterprise architect and the enterprise architecture team. They're the enterprise-wide city planners, if you will, and uh, what we're hearing from many organizations is that we've got a lot of building architects, we've got a lot of systems guys, but not a lot of people that have the perspective and understanding that we typically attribute to, to the enterprise architect or the enterprise architecture team. And we need more of those people. We see that the need for that type of person just growing exponentially over time. Everybody wants a definition of enterprise architecture. And there are many, many of them out there. And there's a lot of argument, and I'm sure you've all been to plenty of EA conferences where we get into arguments over definitions and terminology and usually don't get very far. This is a definition. I wouldn't say it's necessarily the best definition. It's not one necessarily that we endorse, but uh, and it's, in my opinion, more of an IT-centric definition. We're going to talk about the evolution of, of enterprise architecture here in a few minutes, but most of the definitions get to some of these basic basic tenets um, as far as articic uh, articulation of the, the strategic requirements of the enterprise, modeling the future state, current state, and roadmap to get from current to future. Um, we're going to talk about an effort underway within the Federation of Enterprise Architecture professional organizations to put some consistency around how we talk and think about enterprise architecture, and I'll come back to that in a second. So the traditional um, enterprise architecture stack is on the left-hand side. Uh, different perspectives, frameworks might call these layers something a little different. Most generally follow uh, this structure or something very similar, where you have the business architecture layer, the business process layer, the data and information architecture layer, the applications layer, and then the technical and infrastructure layer. Um, th those are the tip typical layers that I think most of us recognize. Now, as we start thinking about enterprise architecture moving from its traditional roots in IT, 
to being true enterprise architecture across the whole enterprise, not just enterprise IT architecture as it's thought of in many organizations today. What we're hearing from many of our members and, and through Gartner and others is that we're slowly but starting to, to make that evolution to true enterprise architecture. So what what um, you're starting to hear from Gartner, Open Group, and others is that if we we're evolving beyond our roots in IT, then perhaps the traditional IT stack needs to be revisited. This is an early version of um, some work being done with the Open Group. Len Feskins, if any of you know the Open Group, is is working on um, kind of the next generation of the traditional EA stack. And I'll come back to the, the, what you see on the right-hand side. I'm going to talk about it a bit more here in a second. And any of you that are in my master's class, uh, I, I don't know if Gloria uh, is on the call and others, uh, we're actually going to hear from Len next week, and he's going to talk about this perspective or this this evolving perspective on EA. Um, so again, with the, the, tr the traditional uh, layers of the stack, most of us are familiar with these, the business architecture, data and information architecture, application architecture, and the technical and infrastructure architecture. So I won't spend any more time here. And then, you know, the traditional process that we think about, understanding the current state, uh, uh, judging alignment, or in most cases misalignment with business strategy and where the organization needs to go, developing our, our future state uh, in these different areas, what we want to look like when we grow up, and how are we going to get there, um, and the portfolio of projects we undertake to get from current to future. Now, um, if you uh, buy into the argument that um, EA is evolving, or uh, albeit slowly, from its roots in, in IT, then, you know, as I said, the, the discussions that are going on in the open group is, well, what, what should the IT, or what should the traditional EA stack look like going forward? So, again, you're not going to see this out there anywhere yet. This is something still very much in development. It may look a bit different in this uh, after it goes through different iterations, but currently um, you know, we're looking at you know the, the vision, mission, strategy, and goals. And really, what we're trying to do here is is um, express the different layers of the traditional stack in terms that are understood and valued by everyone in the organization, not just the IT organization. So if you look at the the last um, the the lower level, for example, physical and tangible assets, rather than just talking about uh, uh, technical infrastructure, uh, network architecture, et cetera. Um, this uh, this uh, uh, broader view, if you will, is talking about all assets, not just technology assets, and how we understand and 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 uh, assess those. So again, this is uh, a work in process, but it's all uh, going back to uh, providing an architecture-driven approach to business planning uh, of, of all types, uh, not, not just IT. And some of the typical steps that we follow and have evolved in the IT area, and now we're trying to apply that thinking and, and those methodologies to areas outside of IT. And organizations of all types are, are uh, talking about this. I Just a few weeks ago, I was in Denver presenting to a, a meeting of uh, Lockheed Martin's global EA practice, so there about 250 people from, from all over the place. And this was the, the topic of conversation. I was the keynote for that event, and I presented this broader approach or per perspective to enterprise architecture, and it really set a, a tone for the rest of the discussions throughout the meeting. So as I said, organizations of all types are, are thinking like this today. And then um, you know, the, the next question that typically comes up once you start broadening the discussion is where should EA sit long term in the organization? Currently, it typically sits under the IT organization or under the CIO. Um, yeah, when you start talking this way, then typically the next thought or one of the next thoughts is that, well, should this sit under something like strategic planning? If it's this bridge between strategic plan or between strategy and execution, might it make sense more? Uh, to, uh, might it make better sense to sit under strategic planning? And technology is pervasive in everything we do today, so we'll, would that make sense? Um, Gartner um, uh, agrees with this perspective, and they claim that they've got dozens and dozens of clients that are going through this discussion now. Uh, I haven't seen anybody actually make that move yet, but the discussions are happening, and it'll be interesting to see, to see who's the first to, to make the move. So, and again, what we're trying to do um, through the enterprise architecture uh, practice the type of uh, uh, analysis, planning, and design that we attribute to EA. We're trying to deliver better business agility, 
and some of the typical benefits that we attribute to enterprise architecture. We've talked about many of these already. Efficiency, effectiveness, agility. The last bullet point, if nothing else, it provides a common language, a common way of thinking, representing, and discussing the enterprise, which in many organizations doesn't exist today. They, they understand how to think and talk about their silos, but there's not a common perspective, a common vocabulary in many cases across the enterprise. So at, at the bare minimum, um, EA can bring that to the organization. And then, um, you know, uh, most, um, I don't want to say most importantly, but what, one of the, the two of the major drivers that we hear from organizations is operationalizing alignment with strategy, which we've already talked about. It's a, it's a it can be a very powerful mechanism to operationalize uh, a strategy and alignment with strategy. And then answer, enterprise transformation. If you look at uh, the typical transformation process, you know I don't know how you can really do a, a, an enterprise-wide change or transformation without going through the type of planning and ana analysis and design that we typically attribute to enterprise architecture. Uh, this gra graphic comes from uh, Jeannie Ross's book on enterprise architecture strategy, and again, it just reiterates what we've been talking about, that enterprise architecture uh, can be a very powerful and should be a, uh, that bridge uh, that's missing in many organizations between strategy and execution. And you know, they go on to argue that if we were better at uh, enterprise architecture in many organizations, then those figures that we quoted from Michael Porter, we wouldn't have 80% of organizations um, uh, either poorly executing or, or failing to execute their, their business strategies. So let's transition now to the Center for Enterprise Architecture. Um, I'll give you just a real quick rundown on the history of how we got here. Again, I said we started this um, at the beginning of the, the, the global financial crisis. Um, I've been connecting dots in the marketplace through the consulting and work I do within Penn State with different organizations for some time, went to our dean at the time, and made the business case for the opportunities that I saw for us in, in this space and how in many ways it was a natural evolution for us from our roots in enterprise integration. So honestly, I think he got about half of what I was talking about. Um, and I, I realized that coming into the conversation, so uh, I suggest that as a validating um, exercise, the creation of a tier one corporate and government advisory group, and for the corporate folks, require $15,000 to essentially set its table. And if we can get organizations to do that in the middle of the Great Recession, when many of you couldn't travel down the hall without three levels of approval, um, then we're fairly well validated. So again, to make a long story short, fast forward, we initially raised well over a half a million dollars. Uh, we have over 70 organizations now from over seven countries and counting, and uh, almost every week I get a new inquiry from somewhere in the world about uh, something that we're doing. So what were the big idea areas? What were the, the idea areas that everybody bought into and, and got people interested in, in helping us build this center and programs? Um, we we initially divided this large group into four primary areas, three focus on education. One, we had an education committee, and let me go to the, the next slide, uh, helping us define what competencies we should be building in a new undergraduate focus area in enterprise architecture. Now, oftentimes when I mention undergrads and enterprise architecture in the same sentence, I get a hold on, time out, you can't create an enterprise architect in a four-year undergraduate program. And our perspective is, you're absolutely right, we're, we're not pretending that's even remotely possible. This is more akin in concept, perhaps, to, say, pre-med, where if we give the students the right business foundations, good foundations in enterprise technology, good foundations in enterprise architecture concepts, principles, and good experiential components, and then when we typically, when we wrap things that way, the next question is, well, when can I hire these students because I don't see them coming out of any other undergraduate program? We actually have companies setting up recruiting relationships with us in anticipation of undergraduates um, that graduating with some knowledge of enterprise architecture, which is really neat to see. Second uh, area, master's level education. I had a, a master's committee working with us to define the competencies that we should be building in our new online professional master's program in enterprise architecture. I'll talk a little bit more about the master's program in a minute. That's typically an area of great interest. Um, we officially uh, launched the program this semester. It was approved uh, last spring by the Board of Trustees, and the inquiries have just been off the charts, and I'll talk more about that in a second. 
Third area, professional development, what type of non-degree bearing education uh, should we be offering um, as a university? We don't want to compete with any of the training providers, et cetera, that are in our group. And we have an initial professional development offering. Uh, it's an introduct it's a self-paced online introduction to enterprise architecture that's been very popular. It's for people not only that are new to the field, but also for people outside of EA that need a common understanding of what EA is and the value that it brings to an organization. It's about 40 hours in length. We've actually had a number of people from Oracle um, go through this course in the past as well. Uh, and then the research group, uh, helping us define the structure of our research center and uh, our initial research members, uh, research level members, uh, vote on the research direction and research streams of our center. And I'll talk about some of those in a moment. So the center um, nationally is unique in that we have, by design, a dual research and education mission. We see the research and education pieces of enterprise architecture being very synergistic and, and tightly intertwined. Uh, most centers that you see at a, a, an institution like Penn State focus just on research. But we, did, we didn't think that that was a good idea in this space. We needed to really focus on both so that the research is uh, uh, updating the curriculum. So we were always in, in interjecting leading edge topics and thinking into the curriculum. And then conversely, the, the revenue flows back from the educational programs help to support the center as well. So it's a, it's a unique design. Okay, let's uh, just talk a little bit more about the master's program. It's typically an area that, that folks um, want to know a little bit more about what we're doing and, and the structure of the program. Our program is the first enterprise architecture master's program in North America and the first online ma uh, master's program in EA in the world. Uh, we've been offering classes now for about a year and a half. Um, many people started taking classes uh, in anticipation of formal approval. We were formally approved um, last spring by the Board of Trustees. Gartner um, officially endorsed our program in April, wrote a nice piece on us. They've written actually a couple nice pieces on us. And it's the first time Gartner's endorsed an educational program, and they've been involved with our center and our efforts from very early on. And we also have a graduate certificate in enterprise architecture, which essentially is comprised of the first three courses in the master's program for those that might not want the complete master's program, but want um, kind of the heart of the enterprise architecture part of the program. Some of the areas of focus, some of these warrant um, complete classes, others are um, um, maybe modules in different classes. Um, we have a unique partnership with our College of Business, the, the people that, that um, maintain our online MBA program. So about half of the courses come from our online MBA program. And then the other half are unique courses that we're developing from scratch focused on different areas of enterprise architecture and modeling and leadership, et cetera. So it's, this is easily the, the most well-vetted master's program anywhere in the country. I've never seen a group of this size come together uh, to you know, uh, advise on a project like this. So easily the most well-vetted program that I've seen anywhere. Some of the current research activities. Um, we have many different research streams underway. Some of the the major ones that we're working on right now, I'll come back to the career path development. That's being done in conjunction with the FIPO organization, so I'll come back to that in a second. Um, framework development and usage. Um, everybody in this space thinks they have the secret sauce behind enterprise architecture. You know, they've developed that unique hybrid approach using elements of some of the popular frameworks and methodologies, but there's been absolutely no research done on what these frame frameworks look like, these hybrid approaches look like, and then um, the goal would be to provide some guidance for organizations that are just starting out and how to construct your own hybrid approach to enterprise architecture. So we're doing some active work in that area. Maturity assessments, uh, there are many different maturity assessments out there for, for EA and EA-related areas. So then when you see that initially, you may think, boy, the last thing the world needs is yet another maturity assessment. However, um, all of these, or most of these assessments, are very IT-centric and assume that EA sits in the, the IT organization, which is valid in, in most organizations today. However, as EA expands beyond IT, um, we're hearing a need, and we're actually using this right now with, with Lockheed Martin, uh, for a maturity tool that measures the maturity of your enterprise architecture in, in different key areas, regardless of where it sits. So it's not overly IT-centric. So we've developed a model that we feel um, fits this need, uh, does not 
uh, allows you to measure the maturity of your your EA organization regardless of where it sits, whether it's under IT or not under IT. And we've vetted it with a number of organizations, and we're using it on a longer-term project with Lockheed Martin right now, and it's been very well received. Uh, we also have faculty doing research on EA stakeholder analysis and engagement under, and, and uh, understanding EA styles and patterns. I'm doing uh, further research and value measurement for enterprise architecture. Um, this is a, a problem area for many organizations. How do we measure and, and communicate the value of what we're bringing to the organization? And um, we're actually getting ready to put out a, a paper. Uh, we did a study uh, some time ago trying to peel back the onion in this area. Are you measuring value? If so, what metrics are you using, et cetera? Because there's not a lot out there right now. It's all, it's all very high-level stuff. And um, about half the organizations aren't measuring value at all, and the other half are just have a handful of metrics and no real thought process behind the selection of those metrics. So we've developed a, a framework and a process to help organizations understand what metrics make sense for their organization. You see too many articles out there that these are the top five or ten metrics that you should use to measure enterprise architecture. And you know maybe those metrics are right for your organization. Maybe not, maybe they aren't. Maybe other metrics are better suited. So we've got a process that that uh, and a framework that helps uh, take into account uh, a, a variety of factors, such as the uh, the KPIs and how key business processes in your organization are, are measured, who the key stakeholders and what do they value. So so things that are looking at uh, how the business values what it does and how you contribute to those value measures versus what you see in a lot of EA teams, they're measuring how well they do things. So they're measuring how efficient they are internally, which is fine. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But if you're not able to measure and articulate the, the value that you're adding to the business, then what good is it really that you're really good at what you're doing, but you can't really tell the business how you're impacting it? And that's what we see in you know, many EA teams today. Um, so then moving on, uh, application of EA to areas outside of IT supply chain in particular, um, where Penn State has one of the leading supply chain programs and supply chain research centers in the College of Business. And we've been talking with them about doing some projects um, that would apply EA to supply chain analysis and design and planning, uh, initially doing a mapping of the SCORE model in the supply chain world to something like TOGAF and then uh, applying it on, a, on a, a, a small project or a pilot project. And we've got a couple corporations that are very interested in seeing this happen, Boeing and, and Lockheed Martin in particular. Okay, so some of our goals. You know, we're in the process of launching our master's program. Like you said, we've been getting uh, interest from all over the globe. Uh, it's, uh, I think the initial enrollment projections or initial enrollments have exceeded uh, all the projections. Um, we've, we're, we're getting tremendous interest. Undergraduate focus area is being launched as we speak. Um, eventually what we'd like to do in the undergraduate level is do a joint undergraduate major with the College of Business and we're uh, working towards that goal in discussions uh, as we speak. Our research portfolio is off and running and um, I hit some of the, the highlights with you already. And then the expansion of the center. We have corporations contacting us, uh, like I said, all, almost every week, every other week about the center and joining the center, et cetera. And we just had Walmart, Siemens, and Merck Pharmaceuticals uh, join within the last few weeks. Current members, got a good mix of industries, public, private organizations, et cetera. A good, really good group of people. Uh, we're actually having our annual members meeting next week, or I'm sorry, two weeks, um, in uh, uh, King of Prussia, Lockheed Martin's hosting it for us this year. Usually one of our corporate members hosts the meeting for us. Uh, YPRO did the year before, and Lockheed Martin's uh, hosting it for us uh, this year in King of Prussia. Okay, now I'd like to wrap up and then allow some time for Q&A. Uh, with a little dis uh, brief discussion uh, on the Federation of Enterprise Architecture Professional Organizations. So the what drove me to, to start this group, um, as many of you know, there are many, many different professional organizations in this space. As with any relatively immature discipline or, or newer discipline, there's typically a lot of uh, different organizations all vying to be you know, the organization in the space. And there's really no clear leader right now. Uh, so what, and I sit on the boards and working committees of many of these organizations. So what I saw happening, uh, you'd see good work being done in one area, but it's done in isolation of all the other organizations. So one group would come out with 
say their set of competency standards or what have you, and then the other groups that weren't involved would nay naysay those and come out with their own, and it just creates a lot of fragmentation and confusion. Um, you know, who's, who's standards or certifications are better than the others and there's really no body out there to say whether a particular certification for example is good bad or somewhere in the middle so we've got a, a, many people just throwing out shingles offering certifications and there's really no way to quality check these things even internally get back to the career pathing stuff we have a lot of uh, organizations coming to us to asking for guidance on setting up their career paths because there's really no guidance out there. So what many organizations do, um, you know, I'm th I think Oracle's probably in this boat as well from what I know about you folks internally, and there's nothing wrong with this approach. It's, it's really the only approach available to organizations today. You get the best people you have together. You set up a career path that seem to make sense. Typically, you wrap some type of internal certifications around them, and that's what we see going on. Uh, but there's really no um, uh, general agreement between the organizations and, and, and the industry and what these career paths look like and what should be in different levels of certifications. So as a result, you you can't really compare a level two enterprise architect certification from Raytheon to a bronze level enterprise architecture certification from Cisco. And you see colors and numbers and all kinds of things used, but there's really no way to, tra to transfer these things between organizations or, or, or have any consistency. So. Again, to make a long story short, um, I, uh, about three years ago, I called the leaders of the six larger professional organizations that were involved with us here at Penn State, invited them to kind of a summit meeting at Penn State to talk about how they might better communicate, coordinate efforts, consolidate efforts, et cetera. And you know, honestly, I wasn't sure whether they would attend at all. They all came, and I think everybody realizes that it's almost a united we stand, divided, who knows what's going to happen. And one of our goals at Penn State is to see enterprise architecture become more of a mainstream academic discipline, not just this unique program at Penn State, and, and help enterprise architecture evolve into, quote, a real profession on par someday with, you know, established professions like accounting, engineering, et cetera. We've got a long way to go to get there. But if the industry doesn't get its act together and put more of one face towards this profession, it's going to be a long time in the making and, and you know, may never happen. So again, um, uh, we had these six initial organizations. What came out of this discussion was the concept of FIPO, the Federation of Enterprise Architecture Professional Organizations. Almost a United Nations in some way for, for this space. A mechanism for continued communication, collaboration, et cetera. And what came from those initial six organizations? We're not, now up to almost 20 organizations from around the globe. So this is an idea that's really caught on. It's an idea whose, whose, I feel whose time has come. And we've got over 20 organizations from around the globe, a very aggressive roadmap of projects uh, to make an impact on the profession. And I'll cover a few of those in a second. Here is, actually, I need to update this list. We just had the uh, Netherlands Ar Architecture uh, Society join. So we've got a, almost a who's who's list of EA groups and people and groups that service subsets of this community. So the data architecture folks, the business architecture folks on down the line. And uh, we've got just about everybody that's in this space uh, involved in, in one way or another. Um, so some of the goals, we talk about some of the big projects. Like I said, well, it's about 20 member organizations. It's kind of incredible how quickly things have grown. And again, I get inquiries about FIPO from all over the globe on a regular basis as well. Initially, it was about building trust between the members. You know, we've looked at um, organizations like this in other industries, and they've always failed. Uh, and the main reason for the failure was always one of the larger organizations approaching the smaller. And they were always met with you know, mistrust and suspicion, et cetera. Here we had a neutral party, me being from a university, um, as the Switzerland in the middle of all, of all of this, if you will. So in the early days, and I still do this to some extent, troubleshoot a lot of different issues between the member organizations before they become larger issues. And now I, 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 we're, we're really at the point where we've built a trust level between the representatives of these organizations. And we're really, we've got a pro productive work environment now. Many people said I'd never get them together, I'd never keep them together, and then I'd never get them working in a positive direction. And uh, we're, we're, we're going in a very positive direction now. So some of the things that we're working on that I think are going to make a real impact on the profession over the, the next year or two. 
me skip ahead one bullet point. Uh, the EA perspective paper. Um, FIPO is in the process of taking over the editorship for the Wikipedia entry on enterprise architecture. Uh, we've been asked to assume the editorship uh, for that information, and as a prelude to uh, assuming that editorship, we are in the process of developing what's really a definitional paper. We're calling it a perspective paper. Anytime you use the word definition in this space, it puts the hairs up on many people's necks. And so we thought perspective was a, maybe a little less um, threatening to people. But it's, but it's really at the heart of it, it's a definitional paper. What, what is this? Why is it important? And this will be the first time 20 international organizations came together to develop something like this and endorse it. It's easy to shoot down. If I put out my perspective or definition or you put out yours, it's easy for people to take shots at it and shoot it down. And frankly, that's what we have way too much of today. It's going to be hard to, to take shots at 20 international professional organizations. So that, that uh, we hope to ha have ready to go um, in March 2013. We are also related to that. We are also um, uh, planning a summit on the profession for April 2013 where we ratify this paper and then we also ratify another project that we're working on is the common EA career path framework. So we're looking at career paths from dozens of organizations from all over the globe and we're trying to uh, to identify that common core that seems to apply to most organizations. And then defining that structure, that hierarchical structure, if you will, getting everyone to agree on that. And when I keep telling our member organizations, we just need we need to get something we can all live with as a version one. This is going to continue to evolve. It won't be perfect, but let's get something everybody can live with and and you know as a version one. Uh, get that developed and ratified at this April meeting. And then the phase two will then be to form working groups to build out the competency sets and role and descriptions, et cetera, over the next year, year and a half. Um, and that will all be planned out at the April meeting. Uh, so, uh, and if that wasn't enough, the third major project we have is um, an EA Bach project. MITRE, um, some of you might be familiar with MITRE, they're kind of a government think tank organization. They developed the original EA body of knowledge back around 2003 and honestly haven't done much with it since. They now have funding to revamp and re-release that BOC and they've approached FIPO about providing the community involvement and help and the governance structure to make it a true community EA BOC. And we're, we're, they're actually coming to our next FIPO meeting in November to talk about how we work together and, and plan out uh, the revamp and relaunch of this BOC project. And what's exciting about this, um, this has always been on our roadmap of activities, many of the organizations in our group have their own bodies of knowledge. So the data architecture folks have their body of knowledge. There's a couple business architecture body of knowledge. There's a lot of BOCs out there, and it's very fragmented, and you know everybody has their own BOC. So what we hope to do over time is use the MITRE BOC as the core BOC and then have some coordination between all these different BOCs. So for example, the data architecture folks, we would coordinate with them to, to determine how much in data architecture we cover in the core MITRE BOC and then where we pass off to them and link to them and then they drill down uh, much deeper in data architecture and related topics. So then we've got some coordination between all the different BOCs that, that are out there and over time, Maybe have it be one one coordinated um, block universe with everybody, you know, focusing on their respective areas, but with some coordination and and sense and, and uh, communication between all the different block efforts. So that's and I believe all of these different efforts are very much needed and will really help uh, be major steps in the evolution of the profession. Okay. And I'm about right where I want to be. So what I'd like to do now, and I know we threw a lot out there, I'd like to entertain your questions. Dr. Cameron, first, this is Jeremy again. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a great, um, great overview. Uh, and I, I personally took away uh, a few obser observations. Um, one is that with the makeup of your faculty and your curriculum, um, it's, it's very clear, and that's what I was you know, really excited to have everybody on this call here that, you know, there's a big E in EA and it's much broader, there's a much broader role in technology, which is, you know, kind of the next observation is that um, there's, you know, an active effort in the industry to mature this profession and to kind of 
of solidify that place in the enterprise with the big E, big enterprise architecture, not you know a systems technology focused uh, perspective. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask the first question just to get things started. Sure. Anyway, um, everybody on this call is from you know we all work exclusively with the public sector, so I'd like to get your thoughts um, on where you see EA. Yeah, currently in public sector, both federal and state, um, and where you think it might be going. And then the second part is, do you see any examples of, of where, you know, where it's headed, what, you know, where it's headed in the right direction or who's doing it right? Okay, yeah. And um, just to give you a little background, um, uh, Scott Bernard, so if you're all in the federal sector, you all – no, Scott, the chief architect for the federal government, and Walt Ocon on the DOD side. He's the keeper of the DODAF. They're both very actively involved in what we're doing here. And I'm actually on a – Scott's asked me to be on a, a working group uh, for EA education within the federal government as well. Um, so I'm very plugged into what they're doing, and, and as Jeremy mentioned, I'm also very plugged in to the state level as well through NASIO, the National State Association of CIOs, and uh, I, I do a lot of work with them as well. So what I see going, um, and you know, if you talk to Scott, and he loves Scott's a great guy. I have him speak in some of my classes as well, Scott Bernard. Um, he's encouraged um, because of um, some of the financial straits that we're we find ourselves in with the government. So uh, in the past, when times were better, and this isn't every federal agency. Some of them are doing a great job, but there's a lot that uh, just use EA to comply with Klinger Cohen, you know, with the and just use it as a reporting exercise, you know, do their artifacts. But they don't really use it to improve their operations and efficiencies, et cetera. It's more of a, a compliance um, exercise. Uh, but what we're seeing now with you know the the coming budget cuts or budget cuts that are in place, austerity measures, et cetera, that people are looking at EA in some cases seriously for the first time uh, to, to really do what EA can do for the organization and not just have it be a reporting exercise. Uh, so that's encouraging. Um, and he's getting a lot of you know renewed emphasis and, and interest in, um, uh, in what he's doing and, pro and proposing. And you're also seeing, and I, I guess it's okay to say this, and some, if you guys are tied in, you probably uh, already have heard this, uh, that there's a common convergence um, between the DODAF and the FIAF on the federal side. So Walt and Scott have been talking for some time about one common framework for all of government, and uh, for whether you're DOD or federal. It's going to uh, take, a, I think, in my opinion, it's going to take a while to get that in place. You've got a lot of, you know, uh, potential sources of resistance, a lot of infrastructure in place, et cetera, but they're working towards that. Um, and uh, how long it's going to take, I, I don't know, um, but I know they're actively discussing this. Um, on the DOD side, um, you know, obviously they've been doing EA for a long time, but the DODAF is very much systems architecture and systems oriented, and you're starting to see more of a, an appreciation for a need for an enterprise-wide view and enterprise-wide thinking and not so much systems thinking as as you typically see a lot with the DOD folks. They they tend to, and just because of what they do, they tend to be very systems oriented in, in their thinking, but I'm seeing that change. Even with companies like Lockheed Martin, they see the changes coming. And uh, they've got a lot of systems-oriented folks, a lot of technicians that have been developing systems. And you know, most of those people, honestly, have a, tub have a, a very difficult time making the transition into a more strategically thinking, enterprise-wide thinking perspective. Some can, but many have, have a problem. And I can touch on that in a second. That's the biggest issue I see in this evolution is, is people and getting the right people. Um, but Lockheed uh, is, is very much evolving their perspective on enterprise architecture to be true enterprise-wide architecture, and they see that they need to do this. They, they, as defense changes and defense budgets change, uh, their intent is to you know, maybe uh, go after more private sector business uh, than they have in the past and not be as reliant just on, on DOD and systems uh, projects. Um, and then the last point I'll make, and I'll turn it over to some more questions, the thing I hear from company after company after company um, and the, 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 big, the biggest uh, hurdle or, or impediment to this evolution uh, beyond IT and evolution as this, strategic, as this bridge between strategy and execution, et cetera, I believe is people. Um, we have a lot – since EA grew up in IT, we have a lot of technically oriented people doing very good work, very, very good job, 
and then they try in many cases they're they're they put in these more strategically oriented roles and some some do fine but but many do not and finding this and developing this next generation if you will of EA professionals that has this strategically oriented focus and understands business and strategy, et cetera, as well as they understand technology is a challenge. That's the biggest challenge I, I hear from people. Uh, Microsoft, for example, I spoke to a group of their EA leadership a few months ago in Redmond, and they project over the next four years they're going to need something like 15,000 new EA professionals uh, to keep up with growth around the globe, and they don't know where they're going to find them. Um, you know, they can try to uh, uh, develop from within, hire from other organizations, they're looking at hiring from programs like ours, a combination of approaches, but, and I hear this from organization after organization after organization, I think you folks are, from the people I've talked with at Oracle, are facing similar issues internally at Oracle as well, uh, but it's a, it's a global issue. Yeah, absolutely, I, you know, I know it's difficult, you know, and everybody on this call is, is either gone through or going through this process internally, but it is, it's hard to find the right people, and that's what I, 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 you know, I think most of us face on this call, because we, we are all on this call customer, you know, facing people. We all interact on a daily basis, and people that get put into these EA roles are, you know, the folks that were really good DBAs or great Java programmers that have, have or network engineers who have matured in the organization um, have a hard time taking that next step into the, you know, the strategy. So, um, uh, so one question uh, from the chat board um, that uh, Ajmal Zayed asked, then I'll, you know, um, is in terms of framework, uh, does Penn State follow a framework? Or are you creating one that you're, you know, will be interested in the Yeah, okay. Uh, good question. I get this question a lot. Now, our perspective is, and if you look at, um, and we're actually releasing a paper on this in the, in the near future, as I said earlier, most organizations um, adhe today adhere to some type of hybrid approach. And like I said, everybody feels they have the secret sauce and they've developed the framework that, that is superior to all others. So I hear this over and over again. Uh, and the fact is, I don't think anybody really has a secret sauce in this area. Um, so rather than... Uh, we give a, a compare, contrast, and overview pros and cons of the popular frameworks and methodologies. We don't, by design, drill down deeply in any of them, but rather give you the tools, the perspective to develop or understand the questions you should be asking and how to develop that hybrid approach that works for your organization. And that's what's really resonating with organizations of all types. There's plenty of places to go and get TOGAF training or DODAF training. And most organizations want uh, a person with this broader perspective that knows the right questions to ask and, and, and can uh, help construct this hybrid approach. And, and even if they don't, if you are in a DODAF or a pure TOGAF shop, uh, you can drill them down then deeply into whatever framework or methodology you adhere to internally. So that that's the approach that you know has been taken by design and through consultation with you know dozens and dozens of organizations, and it, it seems to be resonating well with with a broad cross section of our constituents. Hey, thanks. Yeah, that's uh, you know one of the questions I was going to ask, but you you hit on the point is you know, a lot of customers that we engage with they get hung up on you know what framework should we use and what tool, and it's always you know. Kind of pull yeah, if you want to get me on my soapbox, I've just had so many conversations in the last couple of weeks. People contacting me, and right away, it's well, what tool should we be using? And, and I'm, I, I, I just, this is just yesterday. I said, listen, you're, you're asking the wrong question right now. Right. Yeah, I said, if anything, go without a tool for a year or so. You know, get by on Visio and spreadsheets. You know, it's not elegant, but it works. So you really understand what you need and how you're going to be structured as an organization. Uh, because you can spend a lot of time and money, obviously, on tools, and if that's your first question, then you're thinking about this all wrong. You're thinking from a you know a technician standpoint, not from a you know a broader strategic perspective. So what I'm talking with the, this organization about, really, what we need to do is look at your maturity, where you're strong, where 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 you're weak, and then start, and and let's get the 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 basics down or the foundation down, and then think about what tool set meets your needs. You don't even know what your needs are yet to, to be sele selecting tools. I see that way, way too often. I need to say, same here. 
Um, hey, uh, okay, so I'll pause. We only have a few minutes left, um, and I know I have other questions. Anybody uh, out there on the line want to ask Dr. Cameron anything? Okay, I'm going to take the opportunity then, Dr. Cameron. Um, before we break, I wanted to ask one question in relation to business architecture. Um, you know, there's, you know, as, as you've seen, I'm sure, and, and that I've seen uh, and folks on this call have seen is there's kind of this, um, you know, a little bit of a tension maybe between where business architecture fits. Is it a yeah. separate trend, activity, or is yep. it something that fits in enterprise architecture? And I, I know my perspective, but I'm really interested to hear yours. Okay. Um, and this is... Um a subject of debate within our FIPO members. If you look at that list of organization, organizations, we have the on the business architecture side, we've got the Business Architecture Society, the Business Architecture Guild, the International Institute of Business Analysts, which also has an architecture uh, focus and, 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 and business architects that are involved with that organization. And What's going to come out of this career path thing? So my, my view is if you're doing true enterprise-wide architecture, and enterprise architecture is the wide umbrella and not just enterprise IT architecture, then business architecture fits under enterprise architecture. Now, if your view is that enterprise architecture is just enterprise IT architecture, then you can make the argument that enterprise, business architecture is this thing outside of it. Uh, I, I think that's totally wrong and, you know, an, an, a dated perspective, if you will, and that if we're truly looking enterprise-wide, then business architecture falls under the um, – and that's our, our perspective here. And that's – I think that's more of the the modern or majority perspective. I, it's not that you're not going to find people that are, won't argue that till the cows come home. Believe me, I've, <laughs> I've met them, and I'm sure you have too. Uh, one thing that I hope comes out of these FIPO discussions with the career path and other and the perspective paper – is that we really get together on this. And I've had a lot of side conversations because I know how this is going to have to go. The business architecture folks, um, I've got to I've got to get them and others comfortable with this notion before we ever all get together, or it's not going to go well. Uh, if you if the first time you talk about it is when everyone's together in a group, um, that's not probably not going to go well. So I've been having a lot of side discussions and you know, making sure that everybody feels comfortable with how we're going to position their respective areas, et cetera. And um, I'm hopeful that we'll we'll come we'll generally agree on this broader perspective. But it's you're you're right. It's it's a subject of, of intense debate sometimes. Right. Well, uh, just uh, in respect of, of your time, Dr. Cameron. Um, uh, I just, uh, I guess we'll wrap up. Um, everyone on the call, uh, Dr. Cameron, if it's okay, I'll share the slides with, uh, with the group. Sure, yeah. Please do. Great. And, and uh, so just, again, thank you so much for joining this call. I think that was extremely valuable. Uh, I really appreciate your time. I know you're busy. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm excited for the folks that are going through the program or that will be going through the program and, and hope to get Oracle more involved with what you're doing with people. That would be great. And uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, appreciate the opportunity. Oh, our pleasure. All right. Have a great weekend. Okay. You too. Take care. Bye. Bye, everyone.